been praying and praying and praying, perhaps you're not connected either. And sometimes it's hindrances to prayer. And so right away we think about sin. Oh, they murdered or they raped or they did this or they did that. But today we brought up other things. We gave scripture today that it is. And one can't wait to hear what dad has to say to you. It's that actual excitement because the Bible is alive and it makes you alive. Amen. And it's been said that the Bible keeps away sin, but sin keeps you away from the Bible. Amen. Amen. There's truth to that as well. So, like I said, yes. we need to find out if there's a lack of communication with the Father, where that hindrance is, and we need to fix it, because it's important. There were many other hindrances. I wish you were there. There were many that were, and I thank you for coming. And that's why we go to Sunday school, because we learn, and that's what we're doing, amen? So, Lord God, I thank you. I thank you that you have so much yet to teach us, and I thank you, God, that we are teachable. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that with that heart of wanting and yearning to learn more about you and for you, Lord, that, Father, you will just take over our lives even more. Lord, bless this offering. Use it for the, for the prolonging and, and the growing of your body. Lord, be blessed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Pastor Joe... Check. There we go. Pastor Joe is out ministering to thousands of people today. <laughs> the James went with him because the burden is so great. He's had a football guy. He says, baseball is not even over with yet. Where, where is he? Anybody know? He told me he was preaching. I don't know if my wife mentioned that she mentioned Roy Fields is going to be here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Roy is minister all over the world. He was part of a great revival in Lakeland. Uh, Loretta, did you go to that one? Lakeland, yeah. Florida. And Roy was a worship leader there. I've known him since he was 10. He used to be with me at the Teen Gospel Mission. And the Lord has just got his hand on him. Amen. So it's going to be a Friday night, Saturday night. We'll have regular Sunday morning service. Then he'll close uh, Sunday evening. So the start, he, he put on there 7 to 10.30, but to pay no attention to the 7.30. <laughs> Those of you who have been into his services know but you don't have to stick around till 2 in the morning if you don't want to. <laughs> Good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Would you turn in your Bible in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah. It's easy to find. Get the book of Matthew in the New Testament and go two books to the left. That's the easiest way to find it. Matthew, two books to the left. Matthew, uh, Zechariah chapter 4. When you get there, just say amen. 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 There's three of you. Amen. You're better at. One time I asked the congregation how many thought the book of Hezekiah was in the New Testament. Nobody raised their hand. How many thought the book of Hezekiah was in the Old Testament and hands went up all over the place? And Hezek the book of Hezekiah, there is no book of Hezekiah. Amen. This is the book of Zechariah, starting at verse 6. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Most of us are familiar with that. Where are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Also, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. 
Lord, I come to you today and I'm asking God that you would not only fill this place, we thank you for your presence here, but Lord, I pray that all distractions were removed and Lord, your Holy Spirit will bring this word to our hearts and to our lives today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking that about in the New Believers class today, about how the, it's the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter who's standing up here. And I, I, I told him about Jonathan Edwards. You guys know the story about Jonathan Edwards. He was not an eloquent speaker. And he spoke, he preached a sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And you're familiar with that title anyways. But you may not be familiar with how he did it. He didn't, he wasn't a hellfire and brimstone preacher that just reached out and grabbed your attention. He, he actually read his notes. But the power of the Holy Spirit moved on that congregation. And people started weeping and crying and wailing. So it has nothing to do with the speaker. It's your heart receptive to the Holy Spirit. And that's what we pray today. And last week I preached from the life of Job and all the stuff that happened to him, you know that. And the, it, the end, it has a, they all turned out and lived happily ever after. Why? Because God turned it all around. And I made this statement last week that when his faith didn't give out, God came through. You see, God sees situations different than we do. We see situations, oh my gosh, this is huge. He said, my ways are not your ways. What we see in situations that we face is not the same thing that God sees. And I mentioned this last week about those who were dealing with the devastation of the hurricanes. I feel like they felt like the disciples in the boat when the storm came up and Jesus is sleeping. And they said, don't you care? We've all been there. We've all felt like that. He sees storms differently than we do. So he can be at peace in the midst of the storm because he sees them differently than we do. He sees problems differently than we do. If we were to get a view of our problems, if we were to get a view of our situations from God's perspective, we would have a whole different outlook on it. Amen. So Zechariah was written to encourage and comfort the remnant of Israel to return to the Lord and rebuild the temple. And when he gets there, he's looking at this huge pile of ruin before. Once it had been a beautiful city and a center of worship for his na nation, now it's just a huge pile of rubbish. And as he looks at this overwhelming mountain of rubbish, he gets a word from the Lord. I mean, it's easy to get a word from the Lord when everything is going good, but you need to get a word from the Lord when the bottom falls out. Amen, amen. And some of you are facing some overwhelming mountains in your life, mountains in your health, mountains in your marriage, in your finances, whatever it might be. Well, I have a word from God for you today. Yes. And this is that you've heard the expression, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. And this phrase is used to describe a person who reacts to a relatively small thing as though it was this huge catastrophe. They blow up this small problem and make it something huge. Now, I'm not insinuating that what you face is insignificant. It may indeed be a mountain. It might even be an overwhelming mountain. But like in Job's life, God delights in turning things around. And when you turn the phrase, making a mountain into a molehill, you get my title, making a molehill out of a mountain. Praise God. Amen. This is what God does. I'm going to look at some things that God just loves to turn around. Number one, he loves to turn around major things. This is represented by the mountains. Major thing. Verse 7 says, what are you watching? Oh, great mountain. It was a great mountain. It was an overwhelming mountain. And I want to ask you today, what is your great mountain? A great mountain that you're facing. The major thing in your life that you're taking. From time to time, we will all have a great mountain to face. A major problem comes into our life. A major situation, mighty mountain, big mountains, immovable mountains. Mountains that hinder us from advancing. Mountains that obstruct our path and make the journey difficult. Mountains that afflict our physical 
well-being, our emotional well-being, our mental well-being. We all have them that come into our life. So here's Zechariah. He served in a time when the Jews were returning to their home after being in Babylonian captivity. And God is leading them through Jer Zerubbabel to get busy. Start building up the walls. Start rebuilding the temple. And when they get there, they look at the task ahead of them and say, I can't do this. This is, this is just a mountain of ruin. And as they looked at that mountain of ruin, what happens? Discouragement set in. Because it seemed insurmountable. They would never be able to do this. They would never be able to overcome this. And that is how those hurricane victims must feel. When they look at the mountain of ruin that used to be their home. The mountain of ruin that used to be their life. But this is one of Satan's greatest weapons, fear and discouragement. If he can get you discouraged, he's got you defeated. That's right. Because fear activates Satan, such his plan for your life into motion. How does he do it? All he has to do is bring a few obstacles into your life. Yeah. All he has to do is put a little opposition into our life. Yeah. That's what he did to Job. And he will try to make you believe his lie that there's nothing that you can do about this. It's a mountain. It's a major thing. You can't get over it. You can't get around it. And you'll never be able to get through it. Well, that's a bunch of satanic garbage. And I call it satanic garbage because in Florida, it's all flat land down there. But every now and then, you'll see a green mountain. So where did that mountain come from? And you see these trucks going up and down the mountain. Why? Because that's a mountain of garbage. It's all flat except for the mountain of garbage. And that's what this was that he was trying to feed to Zerubbabel, that he's trying to feed to you. It's a mountain of garbage. And facing this mountain of ruin, this mountain of garbage from Satan, Zerubbabel gets a word from the Lord. When you're discouraged, get into the Bible. I, I would like to go around and single a couple of you out, but I'm not going to. Because it seems like when you have a hard time is when you quit going to church. Amen. It seems when you're facing an impossible situation or a difficult situation, you quit going to church. Amen. You're never going to find the answers out there. You need to get to the church when you're discouraged. Amen. You need to get to church when you're Hallelujah. depressed. You need to get to yeah. the church when you're defined. Oh, I want to get to something. Preach. I, I won't even look. Preach. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get to church when you have a problem. Amen. I can't tell you how many times we haven't seen somebody for uh, weeks on end and call, well, I'm going through something. Well, get to church. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. You're staying away from the answer. You're staying away from the very thing that's going to lift you out of the miry clay. Amen. So he gets a word from the Lord. And his word in verse 6 is not by might nor by power. Thank God. Because I'm weak. I'm tired. I'm discouraged. But he gets a word not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. And then the word of God declares this. What are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. Before, listen to this. Before Zerubbabel you will be. It doesn't say before God. Before Zerubbabel. Before this discouraged man, this depressed man. Before him, this mountain will become a plain. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, he doesn't dispute the fact that it's a great mountain. Yes. The word from the Lord to Zerubbabel and to you today is through the power of God. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and Christ Hallelujah. in you, we sang about the Hallelujah. mountain that yes. you face will become a molehill. Yes. So Zerubbabel got a word from the Lord about the mountain he faces. That's God's perspective. It's going to be just the plain before Zerubbabel. And put your name in there instead of Zerubbabel. Amen. Before me, this thing's going down. Amen. And I, I, think, I think it was said derogatory. I think he says, what are you, O great mountain? I'll tell you what you are. Before me and my God, you're a molehill. 
Who do you think you are before me and my God? You are nothing. Amen. Who do you think you are discouragement? Who do you think you are habits? Who do you think you are cancer, disease, yes. de depression, difficulties, yeah. obstacles? Who do you yeah. think you are? Yeah. You are nothing before yeah. me and my God. Yeah. You're not going to stop me. Yeah. He is in the business of making molehills out of mountains. Yeah. There ain't no mountain high enough. Yeah. Yep. There ain't no river wide enough. There ain't no valley low enough to keep them from turning around. Yes. Amen. He will make a molehill out of your mountain. Amen. Amen. If your faith doesn't give up, he'll come through. Amen. Look at verse 7 again. It says, what are you? I love this. I, I saw this. Uh, you, you probably never saw this before. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone or the capstone with shouts of grace, grace. I, so that doesn't look like a, he'll bring forth the capstone. The mountain's going to be level, and he's going to bring forth the capstone. So I, I'll, I'll put it this way: Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will set up. The headstone. It's a dead thing. That's right. Amen. What the enemy meant for evil, Jesus said to your mind. Amen. What the enemy meant for evil yeah. is going to be turned around on his head. Yeah. Amen. And look how it's done. By shouting grace, grace to it. Amen. Now that seems a little bit simplistic. Unless you understand what grace is. Grace and mercy. Grace means the unmerited favor of God and the unending enabling power of God. Amen. The unlimited favor of God and the enabling power of God. He told Paul about his thorn in the flesh. My grace is sufficient for you. This now becomes the most powerful thing that can come against any mountain. Grace. God's grace is not only available for us, it's sufficient for us for any mountain that we face. And so we can declare that unlimited favor and enabling power of God to every opposition, to every problem, to every disease, to every mountain that we face. The unlimited power of God. Yes. Amen. Even in the New Testament, Jesus speaks about mountains and how they'll be moved. By speaking to us. Speaking what? Grace, the unlimited unlimited favor and enabling power of God. Amen. And that will move any mountain. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what the voice of the enemy says. It doesn't matter how high the mountain of garbage is. The power of God will make a molehill out of any mountain. Amen. Next, he turns around minor things. Represented by the molehills. Verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? In other words, he can make something small, something big. God's grace can make a molehill out of a mountain. It can also make a mountain out of a molehill. It doesn't mean blowing up a problem that's insignificant and make it significant. This is making what is small, what is weak, what is insignificant to us into something powerful by the Holy Spirit. So God uses small things. God uses little gifts, small faith, and turns it into something big. A molehill of faith the size of a tiny, small, insignificant mustard seed Amen. can move mountains. Amen. You're never too big. I mean, I'm sorry. You're never too small for God to use you. Amen. That's right. Amen. But you can be too big. Amen. You're never too small to be used by God, but you can be too big. Yeah. There are Christians today, there are pastors out there today that God cannot use. Why? Because they're too big. Amen. Yeah. Amen. If you're, if you're weak, if this is you, you're weak, you're limited, you're ordinary. You know what? You're the raw material God's looking for. Amen. To be powerful for some miraculous things. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, For my power is made perfect in weakness. 
So God not only delights in making molehills out of mountains, he delights in making mountains out of molehills. He uses small things to accomplish great tasks. Small things under the direction of the Holy Spirit accomplish mighty things. He used the weakness and the faith of Abraham and Sarah to bring about a mighty nation. He used a little basket to save a little boy who grew up to have a little speech impediment to open up a big sea. He used Gideon's small army of 300 to defeat a large army of 135,000. You need more proof today? He used a little bit of flour and a little bowl and a little oil and a little jar to bring about a big unending supply. He used a small cloud the size of a man's small hand to bring about a big rainstorm. He used a little girl to relay a small message to Naaman who was healed of a big disease. Oh, do you need more proof? The Bible is filled with it. Amen. He used the small talent of a small boy named David and guided a small, boy, a small stone from a small sling to a small unprotected part and brought down a large giant named Goliath. Amen. He used a small lunch from a small boy to feed a big crowd of 5,000. He used a small, insignificant foolish, uh, foolishness of preaching about a small wooden cross to provide a big redemption for the whole human race. Amen. Oh, you need more proof? Amen. He used 12 little-known, uneducated disciples to turn Amen. a big world upside Come on. down. Yes. Come on. He used a little mud and a few words to give big sight yes. to blind eyes. Amen. He used a small little words written on a small little book to bring down and demolish giant strongholds. And he can use you. He can use your weakness. He can use your limited abilities, your small talent to do great things for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Need proof? Amen. Amen. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, God has chosen the weak things of the world yes. to shame the things that are. Mm -hmm. And he reminds us again in 2 Corinthians 4, when I am weak, then I am strong. We used to sing the song, let the weak say I am strong. Amen. Yes. Let the weak say I, they're weak, but they confess they're strong. Yes. Amen. Because through Christ you can do all things. Yes. Amen. Yes. For who has despised the day of small things? He not only can make mountains into molehills, but he can make molehills into mountains. Amen. And he does it all for the third thing I want to look at. Ministry things. This is the message. This is really the message of the whole Bible. Verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the house, and his hands will finish it. What does that mean? That he who began a good work in you will complete it. Amen. Amen. In verse 10, I want to read this out of the NIV. It says, men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. When God does miracles, all the miracles that Jesus did when he walked the earth and all the miracles have taken place through the power of the Holy Spirit, it is never for a show. It's never for the benefit of the, of the minister. Right. It is always for ministry. Amen. Not minister, but ministry. Amen. The message of miracles is for ministry. He makes molehills out of mountains in our life for ministry. He makes mountains out of molehills in our life for ministry. It says men will rejoice when they see what is being done by God through Zerubbabel. People are watching you. That's what it means. Yes. Your unsafe family members are watching you. Your unsafe co-workers are watching you. Your unsafe friends are watching you. Your life is advertising something. Amen, amen. They see the mountains that have been in your path. They see some of the difficulties that you face. And you are advertising a message depending how you face those mountains. Yes, Do you advertise fear or faith? Uh -huh. Fear activates the devil, like I said, and faith activates God. And when the Spirit of God gets activated, then the message gets activated. And when the message gets activated, ministry is activated. Yes. Amen. Yes. 
So they will either see you in faith with God, level the mountain before you, or they'll see you in fear by the devil, be leveled by the mountain. So they'll either see you stopped in your tracks by a mountain, or they'll see you walking in victory over a mole. That's right. That's right. People rejoiced when they saw the mountain become a molehill before Zerubbabel. Amen. So people are watching us. Do they see you overcome or do they see you walk around defeated? And this is the essence of ministry. It's more than words. It's how we react to mountains that we face. Amen. Ministry is showing people God's grace. Ministry is showing people God's enabling comfort, His presence, His power in the situations that we face. That's ministry. God wants us to hold out a plumb line. Isaiah 28, 17, I will make justice the measuring line and the righteousness the plumb line. As Christians, you may not know it, but the world wants to see a plumb line. Amen. As Christians, God is expecting us to hold it out. Yes. And I believe the world is desperate for us to hold it out. We need and they need for us to hold up a standard in our lives, a standard of holiness, a standard of right, a standard of wrong, a standard of biblical values. Remember that when you go into the voting booth. That's what God expects you. That's the ministry that we're called to. When their marriages fall apart, they know that you've held up a standard and they're going to look to you. They saw a plumb line in your life. That's ministry. When their health deteriorates, they will know that you have held out a standard of righteousness and have come to you for prayer. They saw a plumb line in your life. That's ministry. When they're going through sorrow and grief, they've seen a plumb line in your life and they're going to come to you. That's ministry. When they become convicted of their sin and aware of their need of a Savior, the Holy Spirit does that, but they're going to come to you. Why? Because they've seen a plumb. They're never going to go to a hypocrite. Amen. They're never going to go to one who's out of church more than they're in church. Amen. When they see a plumb line, that's ministry. Amen. They will come to you and want the same God that you serve. Why? Because they saw a plumb line in your life. <laughs> I tell him, Randy, oh, Randy told me a long time, basically, I saw a plumb line in your life. Amen. Actually, he said something, I have been watching you for 25 years. Amen. And you're slow. Amen. <laughs> you should have got it the first year. Amen. <laughs> Second Corinthians says, blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in our in troubles so that we can comfort those who are in trouble. When mountains fall, we'll stand. And we become, when we stand, ministering mountains. God is up to making molehills out of mountains and some mountains out of molehills. Not just for us, but ministry to others. Amen. Would you bow your heads? Amen. I want to thank everybody for the kind cards and gifts of pastor's appreciation. Thank you so much for that. But this is what it's all about. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I know the Holy Spirit has dealt with you. I know the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. I'm going to ask you to come and get out of your seat and come and say, I want to receive Jesus Christ today. Because I want to tell you something. I just did a funeral Friday for a 44 year old man. You don't know when. Man. The answer that you give today when you say no to the Holy Spirit, I, that game show, is that your final answer? Because it might be. You may be giving your final answer to the Lord today. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, there's more people here today. Thank you, Jesus. Don't let no be your final answer to God. Amen. Yes. Yes. He's calling you. The Bible says, yes. all day he holds out his hand. Yes. Come to me. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Honey, you do. Oh. Amen. That's honey, too. Amen. 
Does anybody need some mountains moved into molehills? Just stand where you are. You got some mountains that you're facing. Will you come to the right place? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What are you, O great mountain that faces each one of these that are standing? What are you before them and before Christ in them, before the enabling power of God in them? You will become a plain. So, Lord, I speak that to every mountain that they face today. That God, through the power of Christ in them, that they'll begin to look at these mountains and say, who do you think you are? I'm going to step over in victory over you like a molehill. And, Lord, as they face these mountains, they do so for the purpose of not just them, but ministry. So people watch, Lord, give them victory today, we pray in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Are you feel like a molehill today? Small, weak, insignificant. If that's you, would you stand? I want to pronounce a blessing over you. Lord, as I said today, you can never be too small. You can never be too insignificant. You can never have too little talent or too little anything that you can't use us. We can only be too big. So Lord, these who are standing up today think that they're too small and too weak. Let the weak say, I am strong. Lord, I pray that you would begin to use them in mighty ways. I pray, oh God, that your hand of anointing would be upon them. And Lord, that through Zerubbabel, through them, they'll accomplish great things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Then we pray a blessing over this congregation today, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, for everyone who's come out to hear the word of the Lord today. And we pray that you would go through with them. And Lord, keep mindful that the people are watching. And we take the Holy Spirit with us. And all of God's people said, God bless you.